Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part two of the section of the book titled Characteristic and Minimal Polynomials. In this video, we will focus on the minimal polynomial. A monic polynomial is a polynomial whose highest degree coefficient equals one. For example, consider the polynomial shown here. The highest degree is the seventh degree, and the coefficient of z to the seventh is one. Thus, this is indeed a monic polynomial. Recall our standing assumption that v is finite dimensional. Here's the result that will allow us to define the minimal polynomial. Suppose t is an operator on v. Then there is a unique monic polynomial p of smallest degree, such that p applied to t is equal to the zero operator. Let's look at the proof of this. Let n equal the dimension of v, and look at the list the identity, t, t squared, up to t to the power n squared. That list has length n squared plus 1, and we're in a vector space L of v with dimension n squared. Thus the list cannot be linearly independent. Now let m be the smallest positive integer, such as the list the identity operator, t, t squared, up to t to the nth power, is linearly dependent. The linear dependence lemma implies that one of the operators in this list is a linear combination of the previous operators in the list. It has to be the last one that's a linear combination of the previous ones, because otherwise we could have chosen a smaller value for m. Thus there exist scalars a0 up to am minus 1, such that the following equation is true. Notice that the coefficient of t to the m here is equal to 1. Now use these numbers, a0 up to am minus 1, to define a monic polynomial as shown now. By our construction, p of t is equal to 0. No monic polynomial, q, with degree smaller than m, can satisfy q of t equal to 0 by the way we've chosen m. Thus, the only thing left to prove is that there's not a polynomial of the same degree that would give us 0. So suppose we have a polynomial q, monic polynomial, with degree m, and q of t is 0. That means p minus q of t is 0. Because both p and q are monic polynomials, we have the degree of p minus q is less than m. Thus, q is equal to p, because otherwise we would have a non-zero polynomial of degree lower than m, that when applied to t would give zero. We can make this non-zero polynomial into a monic polynomial by dividing by an appropriate scalar. This completes the proof. The last result says that the following definition makes sense. Suppose t is an operator on v. The minimal polynomial of t is defined to be the unique monic polynomial p of smallest degree such that p applied to t is equal to the zero operator. Let's look at an example. Suppose t is the operator on C5 whose matrix with respect to the standard basis of C5 is the matrix shown here. Your task is to find the minimal polynomial of t. You should pause the video to figure this out. The best way to approach this is to compute powers of this matrix, starting with the zeroth power, which is of course the identity matrix, the first power which you have, and then the second power, third power, and so on, until you see an obvious dependence relationship between them. That will give you the minimal polynomial. Please pause the video now and actually try to do that because in a few seconds, I will give the answer. Okay, here's the answer. Um, if you do the computations, you see that 3 times the matrix of the identity operator um, minus 6 times the matrix of t is equal to the negative of the matrix of t to the fifth power. And there's no similar dependence relationship with lower powers. Thus, the minimal polynomial of t is the polynomial 3 minus 6z plus 5z to the fifth power. In general, there's a fast algorithm for finding the minimal polynomial of any operator. Suppose you have an operator t on our vector space v. Choose a basis of v so that you can work with matrices. 
And then look at the system of linear equations shown here. This is really n squared equations because the size of the matrix of t is n squared. And we have uh, unknowns a0 up to am minus 1. And what you can do with that linear system is apply Gaussian elimination, which is very fast when you have a computer do it, to see whether there are any solutions. Um, stop as soon as you get a solution, and that is the way that you find the minimal polynomial. Because Gaussian elimination is so efficient, this is very, very rapid when implemented on a computer. The next result gives a complete description of the polynomial's q, such that q applied to t is the zero operator. The result states that q applied to t is the zero operator if and only if q is a polynomial multiple of the minimal polynomial of t. Let's look at the proof of this result. We'll start with the easy direction. Let p be a minimal polynomial of t. And suppose q is a polynomial multiple of p. Thus, there's another polynomial s such that q is equal to p times s. This means q of t is equal to p of t times s of t. But because p is the minimal polynomial, we know that p of t is 0. So we conclude that q of t is 0. In other words, we've shown that if q is a polynomial multiple of the minimal polynomial of t, then q of t is 0, completing the proof in the easy direction. To prove the other direction, now suppose that q applied to t is 0. We want to prove that q is a polynomial multiple of the minimal polynomial p. By the division algorithm for polynomials, there are polynomials s and r, such that q is equal to p times s plus r, and the degree of r is less than the degree of p. Thus we have 0 is equal to q of t. You can see the q of t in red highlighted above to remind you of that. And that's equal to p of t s of t plus r of t because of the equation defining q. And that's equal to r of t because p is the minimal polynomial, so p of t is equal to 0. Now the equation above applies that r is equal to 0 because the degree of r is less than the degree of p and there are no non-zero polynomials with the degree smaller than the degree of p such that they give you 0. Thus, going up to the equation in red above, we see that q is equal to p times s. In other words, we've shown that q is a polynomial multiple of p, which is what we wanted to prove. This completes the proof of this theorem. Now let's erase that proof so that we have room to display a corollary of our result. Here's the corollary. Suppose our scalar field is the complex numbers and t is an operator on v. Then the characteristic polynomial of t is a polynomial multiple of the minimal polynomial of t. This follows immediately from our result and the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, which states that the characteristic polynomial of t applied to t gives us the zero operator. We'll see later that this result also holds when the scalar field is the real numbers, but we haven't yet defined the characteristic polynomial in that case. One more comment. Um, if you choose an operator at random, it's most likely that the characteristic polynomial and the minimal polynomial are equal. In fact, that happens almost all the time. Thus, the fastest way in practice to find the characteristic polynomial is to first find the minimal polynomial. If the minimal polynomial has degree n on a vector space of degree n, then we're done. That's also equal to the characteristic polynomial. If not, one can default to finding other methods of the characteristic polynomial. Suppose t is an operator on v. Our next result states that the zeros of the minimal polynomial of t are precisely the eigenvalues of t. Let's look at the proof of this result. Let p be the minimal polynomial of t. And suppose that lambda is a 0 of p. We want to prove that lambda is actually an eigenvalue of t. Well, because lambda is a 0 of p, we can write p in the form p of z is z minus lambda times some other polynomial q. 
Now, for every vector v, we have 0 is equal to p of t applied to v. This holds because p is the minimal polynomial of t, and thus p of t is the 0 operator. If we look at the equation in red in the first column, we see that we can rewrite our last equation as t minus lambda i times q of t applied to v. The polynomial q has degree 1 less than the degree of the minimal polynomial p. Thus, there has to exist at least one vector v such that q of t applied to v is not 0. Thus, if we look at the equation at the top in red, we see that this means that t minus lambda i applied to some non-zero vector is equal to 0. In other words, lambda is an eigenvalue of t. We start out with the assumption, shown in red on the left, that lambda was a 0 of p. We've concluded that lambda is an eigenvalue of t. In other words, we've shown that every 0 of p is an eigenvalue of t. We still have to do the proof in the other direction. And to do that, we'll have to erase this proof to get some room. Let's do that, but we're keeping the assumption that p denotes the minimal polynomial of the operator t. And now suppose lambda is an eigenvalue of t. We want to prove that lambda is a zero of the minimal polynomial p. Because lambda is an eigenvalue of t, there's a vector v that's not zero, such that t of v is equal to lambda times v. Repeated applications of t to both sides of this equation show that t to the jth power of v is equal to lambda to the jth power of v for every non-negative integer j. And then taking linear combinations of that, we conclude that p of t applied to v is equal to p of lambda times v. Now, 0 is equal to p of t applied to v. That's because p is the minimal polynomial of t, and thus p of t is equal to 0. But we saw above that p of t applied to v is equal to p applied to lambda times v. And because v is not the 0 vector, the equation above implies that p of lambda is 0. That's what we wanted to prove. We started off with lambda being an eigenvalue of t. We concluded that p of lambda is 0. In other words, we have shown that every eigenvalue of t is a 0 of p, and we previously proved the inclusion in the other direction. This concludes the proof of this theorem. Let's look at some examples to deepen our understanding of the minimal polynomial. Suppose t is the operator on C3 shown here. We've encountered this operator in previous examples. We saw then that the eigenvalues of t are 6 and 7. This implies, by the result that we just proved, that the minimal polynomial has 6 and 7 as its only zeros. In other words, the minimal polynomial of t is a polynomial multiple of z minus 6 times z minus 7. We also saw, when we examined this example earlier, that the characteristic polynomial of this operator is z minus 6 squared times z minus 7. Because the characteristic polynomial is a polynomial multiple of the minimal polynomial, all these things combined mean that the minimal polynomial of t is either z minus 6 times z minus 7 or z minus 6 squared times z minus 7. However, we can easily check that t minus 6i times t minus 7i is not the zero operator. That allows us to conclude that the minimal polynomial of t is z minus 6 squared times z minus 7. In this case, the minimal polynomial and the characteristic polynomial agree. Let's look at an example with a different operator. To find t on c3 now by the equation shown here. It's easy to verify that for this operator t, the eigenvalues of t are again precisely 6 and 7. And it's also easy to verify that the characteristic polynomial of t is z minus 6 squared times z minus 7, the same as the characteristic polynomial in the previous example. As before, we can conclude that the minimal polynomial of t is either z minus 6 times z minus 7, or z minus 6 squared times z minus 7. In this case, we do a simple computation, and we see 
that t minus 6i times t minus 7i is equal to the zero operator. Thus, the minimal polynomial of t is z minus 6 times z minus 7. This concludes part two of the video on characteristic and minimal polynomials. If you see a small picture of a slide in the upper left corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the next video. If you see a small picture of part of the cover of linear algebra done right in the upper right corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the book's website.